This book is out already from Mareike Ulberg and Clive Hamilton uh, since a while in Germany. And uh, it is just about or just came out in the Anglo-Saxon world. And of course, you can download it uh, with the Kindle easily. So that's why uh, Mareike uh, is, is German. The book is out in German. I have the great pleasure and honor uh, to have with us as a moderator, the former uh, German uh, vice chancellor, as well as uh, foreign minister. Uh, to me, he's an icon. I grew up with him and actually voted for him at one stage, I must admit. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm very happy that Mr. Fisher uh, agreed in order to, to guide us uh, through, through this. Uh, the setting is as follows. Uh, we're going to have a chit chat between uh, the two of them. And then uh, I will intervene once in a while if I find that uh, uh, I have something intelligent to say. So in short, it's possibly unlikely. Um, uh, we have um, uh, 30 minutes afterwards then the possibility to look into your questions. Uh, our chief censor, uh, Jacob, is uh, in Beijing uh, looking at the incoming uh, questions and will then basically uh, see which are the good ones and then go from there. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure this is going to be really, really interesting. So, uh, Mr. Fisher, maybe you just start, or uh, Mareike, whatever uh, the book is all about. Who shall start? It's me? I think you might start. Yes, why not? Okay. I mean, you, you've seen the book. What was your impression? Uh, uh, what, yeah. So, uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to discuss this very interesting book. Uh, reading this book, uh, then uh, I got the fantasy that uh, uh, the Communist Party is everywhere. Uh, uh, my first impression was that uh, it's a, a counter reaction uh, to the rise of China. Uh, it's a reaction to the naivety uh, for decades of uh, the Western, uh, uh, mostly business community, uh, it were very naive. I mean, I'm a former uh, left-wing uh, uh, radical, so for me it was not a, a, a great... Uh, 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 so I missed the word. Uh, for me it was not a, 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 a great uh, a revelation that the communists are communists. And uh, they are Leninists. This is a Leninist party. Uh, since 1989, since the Tiananmen massacre, uh, it was quite clear that uh, the party will fight uh, for life uh, uh, when uh, its rule uh, uh, will be uh, uh, challenged. Uh, but the uh, Western business community uh, was uh, so pleased, and this is an element which I missed in the book, that uh, it's uh, not only uh, uh, the skills of the party to uh, uh, work in the, in the, uh, in the underground or uh, in the semi-underground, uh, but it's also uh, the success of the Communist Party of China is to create a, a hybrid model of a flourishing, very successful market economy, driven by Western investments, driven by uh, uh, investments from outside uh, uh, of the Chinese community. Uh, it's uh, uh, a lot of uh, investment uh, uh, went into um, this uh, flourishing market economy. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's a hybrid model. We have a Leninist uh, one-party rule uh, with all the elements of the uh, a Leninist party. And you have, uh, uh, that's the second element, a very successful, highly competitive uh, uh, market economy. And the greed of uh, Western business community is the driving force for the success also of the party. I think uh, this uh, is very important to understand. And uh, the West will be confronted with uh, two challenges at the same moment. The biggest challenge is uh, uh, the United States, not China. The US 
is saying farewell to its leadership role. And this weakens the West dramatically in uh, uh, the confrontation with China. And the second element is that uh, uh, the greed of the uh, Western business community is highly important and continues even today. So you can find it in the book uh, when uh, uh, Marike and Clive uh, are talking about uh, the friends of China. Uh, a lot of them is uh, driven by economic interest. So these two elements together uh, play a very important role. But last question. What I don't understand in the Western position, even uh, by reading this book, what do we expect from China, from the Communist Party of China? They will not resign voluntarily uh, and uh, they will not change the system voluntarily. They are too successful. And I think uh, the major weaknesses of this system uh, were not mentioned in the book. What is the major weakness of uh, this uh, one party rule, of this Leninist uh, rule? The major weakness is at the very top. Uh, why did uh, Xi Jinping uh, focus all the power on his person? Why? Uh, he, he instigates uh, uh, again uh, the fears in the in the party elite about uh, uh, a second cultural revolution, uh, uh, Maoist uh, uh, rebirth, uh, because uh, uh, Mao, well, the cultural revolution was against the party elite. It was not, uh, uh, the, the major address was the party elite and uh, uh, Mao was very successful. So after the cultural revolution, after the death of Mao, uh, they uh, decided uh, to produce a collective leadership. They had some uh, limits for uh, uh, the party leadership uh, uh, to stay in office and so on. Now Xi Jinping on the 19th party convention uh, changed all of that. He is focusing only on one person, but this again raises the big question, can this system work in an efficient way. Uh, I think the major risk is at the very top. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, uh, if I'm right, this is an important insight also uh, for uh, the activities of the uh, party uh, outside of uh, uh, China. Uh, from uh, that point of view, I would say um, it's, for my taste, it's a little bit too pessimistic, the book. Uh, <laughs> the, the facts are more or less correct, as far as I know. Uh, but it's too pessimistic. It's uh, China, the Chinese Communist Party is uh, extremely clever, is on the path of victory everywhere. I don't see that, by the way. And uh, take, for example, the mistake they made in Germany, uh, it, was a, it was a mistake which was not realized at the very beginning by them. Uh, it's uh, the, when, they, when uh, Medea bought KUKA, this was the wake up call in Germany. In China, it, it, it was not a strategy. Uh, so I, I think they, they are making mistakes and uh, the West could uh, calculate with these mistakes and react uh, in a wise way. So, but the big question remains, which role we think China should play? They will be a dominant, uh, uh, one of the dominant superpowers in the 21st century. It's too late to stop that. It's a matter of fact. But if you look to the policy of the United States, my question remains, what do they want from China? What do they want? And uh, after the end of uh, reading uh, your book, I'm, uh, didn't get, I'm not closer to an answer uh, to these central question. Which role should China should play? Okay, all right, good. Unmute, um, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I'm going to be extremely boring and I'm going to say that we're actually in a lot of agreement <laughs> on a lot of the points, which, you know, we don't want agreement. We want to, you know, argue here, but let, let me may, maybe elaborate a little bit on, on some of the points that you have raised, Mr. Fisher, which I think are all very important. Um, so first of all, I mean, the main argument is really the, the main point we wanted to make um, is to counter the 30 years of engagement rhetoric that we've had, you know, and if, if we engage with China, eventually China is going to change. And I think there are quite a few people in Germany and Europe and in the world who never had that illusion that this might actually work. But I also know a lot of other people who felt that after the experience of the Cold War, this might actually work. So it's like a weird mixture that it was a slogan that you put out there, we must engage with China in order to change it. And whether people actually believed it or not was kind of up there in the air. But, but the point that we're really making is in all this, and some of this rhetoric continues to this day in, 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 in Germany, at, 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 um, <clears throat> especially in Germany. I mean, you still have um, ministers saying the exact same things these days. Um, is that this <laughs> didn't only, it not only did it not work, um, because we overlook one of the main actors, the Chinese Communist Party, which is not a passive player. It has actual agency. It, of course, saw this coming. It was very paranoid about precisely this and started to prepare a counter strategy. And initially, that counter strategy was based on, was focused on making sure that hostile ideas and that this engagement and change strategy doesn't work in China. So it's like putting up a better censorship apparatus, making sure that your population um, ha gets better patriotic education. But in the long run, the idea was in order for us to have long-term regime security at home, because I also agree with you that the party is deeply insecure and a lot of what we're seeing actually comes from that insecurity and not from a position of security, <clears throat> um, is we need to make sure that we can actually set rules and set standards and set our taboos globally. And so not only did engagement not work, but right now, and this is the argument that we're making throughout the book, we're beginning to see the <laughs> engagement working in the other direction. Now by that, of course, I don't mean that all our countries are ad adapting the Chinese model, but we can increasingly see um, that the taboos and the standards that the CCP wants to export are increasingly being accepted. Um, I mean, 10 years ago, <clears throat> if the Chinese Communist Party would have approached a film festival and would have said, you can't show this movie because it offends us, the reaction would have been instant publicity for that movie. Um, nowadays, what, what happens often, often, not always, but more often than 10 years ago is it's actually taken out of the program and people then say, oh, we had technical difficulties. So adopting the language that's also used on the mainland, um, we see so many, <clears throat> so many companies starting to actually, actually comply with the, with the requests of the CCP and normalizing CCP standards globally because they feel that they have to. And in many ways, if they are active in China, they have to. Um, so it, again, we're beginning to see this strategy <clears throat> pay off. Um, I, I think it's interesting that you say that greed doesn't come through. We had hoped that we had made clear in the book that this is not only, the whole idea is not that this is the Chinese Communist Party that has a perfect strategy and because it is so perfect, this is working, but there is an element, a significant element on our side. Um, I think at some point we jokingly talked about calling this book after what Tony Abbott said, fear and greed. Um, <laughs> so we, we we had tried to we had tried to get that across, and I think in some ways we succeeded by making by making clear that this would not work if there wasn't this willing element on the western side that has placed high hopes on the on on China on making money from China. Um, if that were not the case, it would be a lot more difficult for the CCP to succeed. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I have a chance to clarify that if it didn't come through quite properly, but this is actually something that we think is incredibly important. Without this, if you take out the money factor, a lot of this would collapse. Like we do talk about a lot of networks that the CCP sets up, but I think they only work because people have those hopes of cashing in on a lot of them. And without that, this wouldn't function. Um, now, 
what about the weakness of the Chinese Communist Party? I, I again agree. And this was a bit of back and forth between my co-author and myself and my co-author Clive. He, he was more convinced that, you know, the party is like very strong in, 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 in its strategy. And, and my, my, my point throughout the process, and I had hoped I'd put that some, somewhere in there as well, was again, a lot of what we're seeing here comes out of insecurity, the fact that when you are kicked out, in China, you do not leave office by being voted out of office, but you get kicked out. The whole specter of the Soviet Union, the CCP has done a lot of studies of what happened in the Soviet Union. Um, if you want to scare your cadres, you talk about Romania, you talk about Libya, you talk about Iraq. So this is how you really scare your, your cadres. And a lot of what we're seeing here in the search for control, search for regime security that is now going international, is not, a, it comes from insecurity. Um, and in a way, I also agree with you that they are overreaching. And especially in these past few months with COVID, they have started going against one of the core tenets that we outline in the book, and that is you don't pick too many enemies at the same time. You pick one, you shout at them, you scream at them, and then everybody else falls in line. And over the past couple of months, the CCP has actually picked a lot more battles than is good for the party. Um, now, I've already spoken for, for a very long time, so I'm going to try and come to a close. But um, I maybe want to address that last point. What, what do we want from China? And we, we, we didn't give a good answer in the book, I agree. Um, I do have a lot of thoughts on this. And in, in, at, in, in, in the end, what I want to happen is <clears throat> for Western countries, be that the United States, be that Europe, be that you know, any, any, any other actor out there, need to understand that it's very hard to get the party to do something it doesn't want to do. Like we keep pushing and we keep thinking maybe if we if you ask nicely or maybe if we put all these sticks on the table, we will, for instance, go China into doing structural reforms to its economy. Um, <clears throat> and that that thinking, I think, needs to be abandoned. Um, I think it, it is not impossible to get the party to do something it doesn't want to do, but it's very, very hard. Um, but the, a more, a better, a more fruitful approach to this would be that you really look for the few areas where there are common interests, where there's genuine interest on the side of the party. And on those, you can try and cooperate with China because the, the whole point is not to completely isolate and kick China out of the international system. I think that is incredibly dangerous, but to find the points where you can agree and to work on that, but to also understand that is very difficult to get them. I mean, we've seen we've seen this whole drama with the investment agreement, which negotiations have been ongoing for eight years um, and didn't come to a close this year and are not going to come to a close. And I don't think it's going to happen. But that's again, because demand is something that the Chinese Communist Party is not willing to concede to make those structural reforms to its economy. It's like it's very hard to achieve. I mean, even Donald Trump, he was like slapping tariffs on China and this and that. And in the end, all he got was an overrated purchase order, which, um, <clears throat> you know, might not even get fulfilled. So just have a more realistic assessment of what you can and cannot achieve and act accordingly. Um, and, and that is what I would like to see from Western governments to do more. Well, I agree. Uh that uh, this goal, uh, uh, it's, it's very important. But on the other side, uh, allow me to say, I, I share your view that uh, a lot, uh, what we see domestically happening in China is fear driven. Uh, I mean, uh, the investments in uh, the security apparatus uh, uh, is tremendous uh, in uh, the last years. And we have seen uh, the anniversary of uh, uh, the founding of the People's Republic. Uh, it was all heavily protected. Uh, it was fear driven. Um, so I th we shouldn't overestimate uh, uh, the strengths of uh, uh, this system. On the one hand, on the other hand, I think it's extremely important that we should uh, realize that uh, the decline of the West with the election of Donald Trump and uh, 
the policies which followed uh, is strengthening China. It's opening uh, opportunities for them in the international order. So uh, United West would be uh, extremely important uh, to counter that development. Uh, not to contain China completely, but uh, to set our own uh, barriers, values, based on values, based on uh, uh, common interests. As long as we don't have that, uh, I think we offer opportunities uh, to the Chinese system. And don't forget, they are highly successful. Uh, put aside all the ideological and uh, value-based uh, controversy. I mean, what uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, made an extremely successful model. This is the difference to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was only ideologically successful in the 20s and in the 30s and uh, in the Second World War militarily uh, with the help of uh, Western powers, uh, especially the United States. But it was never a successful social and economic model. Let's face that. And China, uh, the hybrid system of China, this uh, composition of a Leninist model together with uh, uh, most advanced uh, uh, technology and the market economy uh, offers a very successful alternative. And my major concern is less uh, what you described uh, in, in, in your book, that the Communist Party will successfully, um, I don't know the English word, underwandern, was heißt? Undermine, yeah. Undermine, will successfully undermine uh, uh, other uh, societies. But I think uh, the, the, the success of the model uh, might be very attractive for many uh, um, uh, economies in the third world. So uh, whether they can copy that or not, I don't know. On the other side, I'm pretty uh, optimistic. China in all his uh, uh, history, in his long history, was never open to the world. The symbol is not uh, uh, Lady Liberty like in the US. The symbol is a Chinese wall, stay out let us alone. Uh, this will change, but uh, I, I think uh, in the Chinese culture, uh, this is an, an, uh, based on, uh, we see this uh, important uh, conflict in, uh, in uh, Xinjiang uh, with the Uyghurs, um, that uh, China is based on uh, the Han civilization. This is uh, the key element. And they, the Chinese Communist leadership has to run a country with 1.4 or 5 billion people. So uh, I was seven years in a government of 82 uh, million, million uh, people. And to understand what it means to run a country with uh, 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 more than a billion people, um, I have a certain idea. But at the top then to run the world as a world power, it's, uh, I think, too much. So uh, I'm, uh, there is enough space and there will be enough uh, opportunities uh, to balance, uh, uh, to balance uh, uh, communist China globally. And especially if the West uh, can reunite in a post-Trump era, but this, the precondition is that the U.S. Uh, gets um, can can define what they want uh, uh, to reach in the world of tomorrow, and uh, I think uh, we uh, COVID the COVID crisis will change uh, dramatically everything, also in international and global politics. So uh, there are new opportunities, but. Uh, I think the challenge of the system, of the success of the system, uh, is uh, uh, the biggest one. Unmute. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks um, again for some more thoughts. I'll, I'll try to. I'll try to pick up some of them. 
um, and respond to them. So uh, <clears throat> again, I, I agree that one of the goals of the CCP is to make sure that the United States is separated from its allies and in many ways Donald uh, Trump has been... You don't need the, the, the CCP for that. It exactly, was, what I was going to say. It was based on the decision in Washington, D.C. I never dreamed about to, uh, to see a, an American president questioning NATO. You don't need the CCP for that. I totally agree. I was just going to say, again, Trump has been their greatest ally in that regard um, and, and pushing and that goal forward. He started with an action by uh, withdrawing the, the signature of the United States uh, under TTIP. I mean, the guys in, in Beijing, uh, they didn't expect that. They didn't know what happened. But they were, uh, again, uh, the beneficiaries of an action from outside. Uh, Absolutely. Um, we see some of that change currently in the past couple of months, maybe in the last ditch effort to get more, like there's been great outreach in the past couple of months from the United States <laughs> towards Europe. But again, it's not sustainable and it's the actions that count. So again, I completely agree. Trump has been driving that divide. Um, I also don't, my problem, again, of course, on the U.S. side, <clears throat> a lot of the actions that the U.S. Has, has, has taken on China, I actually agree with, especially where human rights pushback is concerned, um, like on the Uyghur Human Rights Act and a lot of other measures that have been pushed forward. So I think a lot of the stuff that's been happening has been good, but it hasn't been done with a consistent end game in mind. And I mean, if we, I don't know if... if if, if anything that John Bolton says in his book about Trump is true, we all know that clearly Mr. Trump has other concerns and is trying to use all these things as bargaining chips and his trade war. Um, <clears throat> so again, what's what's lacking on the U.S. side, and the, which is why I think everybody right now is um, placing their hopes on November, is a consistent this consistent strategy and to actually have an end game. Completely agreed. Um, so <clears throat> depending on whether that works out, I do think. I am somewhat encouraged that there are of the of the reaction over the past couple of months that the US and Europe are starting to work more together. But again, the main challenge remains and we shall see what we will have to deal with um, in November. Um, <clears throat> now, the what's maybe talk about, a little, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's the end game, not for America, for China, but what's the end game of the CCP? Because again, when you talk about, you know, China wants to take over from America. A lot of people do imagine China wanting to take up a similar role as the United States. And no, that's, no, that's not true. I don't think China in that regard in any way wants to replace the United States in the way that the United States has been acting over the past decades. Um, the, the end game, the ideal scenario for the CCP is not to have to get too much involved but again, the, the, the only end game that I think the party is pushing for is to be able to get countries, people, organizations, companies to internalize the interests of the party, the taboos of the party and the rules of the party and to act accordingly. Um, <clears throat> and to, for, for them to actually not have to come out and threaten and to, to, to throw out their sticks, but for countries to actually act in accordance with those priorities, it doesn't have to be absolute, but to just make sure that certain things are internalized by people and that they do it automatically. Not so much <clears throat> as like running the entire world in that regard, just making sure that people understand that, you know, that, you know, the Chinese model is good. That's one of the main messages that they want to get out. The Chinese model is perhaps the model for the 21st century, whereas, you know, democracies are like weird 20th century outdated stuff. So that's one main message that they want to get out and for people to internalize that, that is good. <clears throat> um, and for people to act accordingly and to send out those messages that then, of course, play back into China. Because again, yeah, the main concern of the CCP is its own population in China. Um, and that's always going to be true. And most of the international policy is again going to be driven by those concerns directly at home. Um, so the, the, when we think about, you know, China wants to replace America, the image that we have in our mind is completely wrong. Um, it's not going to take up a role like the United States. Um, it I don't is going agree to be more involved. I don't agree to that. Go ahead. Uh, I think you underestimate uh, the attractiveness and uh, the emotional impact 
of um, power politics uh, on a global level at the top as, at the top level uh, to be number one is uh, a very very powerful uh, uh, desire don't underestimate that and uh, if you look into history it's always the competition about uh, the position number one uh, extremely important and uh, many times I heard from Chinese counterparts uh, discussing uh, the South China Sea uh, they told me look uh, the Caribbean uh, is uh, dominated by the Americans so why do you criticize us when we dominate our backwaters it's all about America and when I was the last time some years ago in Beijing in the night uh, and I saw this modern city it's all uh, it looks like America the shopping malls uh, everything is uh, uh, it's you you underestimate uh, uh, these uh, emotional attractiveness of a power competition uh, to be number one it's not only in the leadership I think it's also in the in a broader in a broad based elite it's uh, it's even it's even dangerous, Marika. It's dangerous. Yeah, I'm not I'm not saying that China doesn't want to be number one. The CCP absolutely wants China to be the number one in the world. Uh, my my whole point was that it's going to look different from how the role of the United States has played out over the past couple of decades. Um, and again, I'm not saying there are, of course, China does have military ambitions. I don't subscribe to the model of China as, you know, has zero military ambitions, but it is going to look different. Look, um, it's, um, China is moving into the Middle East at the moment. Uh, agreement between uh, Iran and China opens uh, the road to the Middle East, the road into the, into the mess. And, uh, hmm. Once you are militarily engaged, you are engaged. Uh, and uh, that, that's the lessons uh, from uh, centuries uh, of foreign intervention in the Middle East. You can't be in the Middle East and be neutral uh, and say, oh, it's terrible, but don't touch us. We don't have to do anything with that. This is impossible. Once you make this step, this has consequences, whether you like it or not. Uh, and uh, once China will start uh, to, uh, to, to engage more on a military level, uh, this will have uh, consequences uh, and it will look similar to the United States. Uh, yeah. What concerns me is that China has given up its uh, the formula of one nation, uh, two systems, which again will uh, contribute to a rise of the Taiwan question. It's not Hong Kong, it's Taiwan. And uh, a future confrontation in the Strait of Taiwan alarms me extremely. So um, this, this has dramatic consequences, uh, not only uh, uh, based on the uh, consequences for the uh, domestic politics, but also uh, uh, for the international global system. Uh, may I just intersect? Uh, uh, I totally agree with your picture that uh, it is a country uh, that has a Leninist party structure and is living the Manchester capitalism, uh, which of course has an incredible allure to many others. Um, but uh, Marika, and, and maybe also to, yeah, I can. Manchester capitalism plus uh, IT. I did, yes, on top of that's, yes. that's the difference. New dimension, new dimension. Yeah. Uh, Marika, and maybe also to you, um, uh, Mr. Fisher, the title of the book is Hidden Hand. Uh, but living here in Beijing and basically en uh, enduring the uh, 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 noise level of uh, propaganda, it, it seems to be more loudspeaker in politics by slogan than rather a hidden hand, which would indicate, you know, it's all behind the back. I, I see you and I read about. Uh, this in your book and you, you outlined this in incredible detail. But if you look into uh, China over the last six months, particularly because also COVID, uh, it seems that China has given up the hidden hand and is now going into the open. 
Uh, and uh, when you look at the ratings across the world, Pew Research and so forth, uh, it seems to be that they possibly have wasted billions in building up soft power, at the same time now eroding in acceptance uh, across the world. So, so how, how do you see this? Have you written your book uh, too uh, late? <laughs> Too late or too early? I mean, depends right. how you look at it, right? Um, no, I mean, I <clears throat> I uh, agree that not not all of this is hidden. A lot of this is very very loud, and we've had a lot of discussions about that. And in the end, you know, uh, uh, the opposite of a perfect book is a book that is done. <laughs> so you know, it's out there. <clears throat> um, I do think yes, a lot of this is very loud. I guess we chose that title because oftentimes, again, you you cannot see what's behind the scenes. And then once you start poking and you start talking to people, you you find out a lot of stuff that never made it into the public sphere. So there is a huge component of stuff going on behind the scenes, but that's clearly not everything. Um, now, what, what has happened in the past couple of months? What has happened from my perspective is under the pressure that the COVID crisis had, has put on the CCP, the party has refocused very strongly inwards, which makes a lot of sense. Like if your economy is faltering and even though the, most, the latest numbers looked very good, they're I think very deceptive. If your economy is more struggling, <clears throat> The, that takes away one of the key pillars of your legitimacy over the past couple of decades. So you really need to focus inward. You need to focus on your regime security, on other sources of, of legitimacy, which in that kind, the, the, the easiest one is nationalism to pick battles and to divert attention. This is not unique to the CCP. Um, <clears throat> but under, those, under this pressure of facing the situation at home, the party has abandoned one of the things that has made it so successful, which I already alluded to previously. And that again is don't pick too many battles at the same time. There's this whole idea that, you know, the number of enemies officially by definition, enemies of the people is a small number. It doesn't usually go above, it doesn't usually rise above 5% um, because one, one thing that's like based on some ideological dogma, but it's also, it's a, it's a very practical thing. If you never pick too many battles with too many people, <clears throat> but make sure to only pick it symbolically with a couple of people that you have identified as being your actual enemies, that ensures that you don't offend too many people at the same time. So in Europe, for the longest time, China was pursuing more constructive relationships with most countries, and then it picked out one at some point that was Norway because of the noble to Liu Xiaobo. Then later it was Sweden because of the dispute that Sweden had with China over its citizen, Guay Minh Hai. And you, you, you bash that country and you pick a battle with that country. And it's small, it's symbolic. <clears throat> it also scares everyone off because of, of course, the reaction of the average European country is not, oh, next time that could be me. But the reaction is, oh, it's good it's not me and maybe I can even profit off of that. So again, here's where greed comes back in. And right now, it has gone against that tenant and is picking battles all over the place, which again stems, in my opinion, from this domestic insecurity, this domestic issue that the CCP is facing, which has led it to abandon, to abandon to care too much about what the international scene thinks and to focus exclusively on what the Chinese public thinks. And that, of course, internationally speaking, is undermining its strategy quite substantially. We'll have to see for how long it is here to stay. I do expect for as long as they are dealing with the fallout from the COVID crisis, we're going to see this aggressive strategy that undermines its soft power substantially for, for quite a while, as long as the fallout from the COVID crisis is ongoing. So it'll be really interesting to watch how that plays out. Marika, let's uh, let's uh, get the audience engaged. Uh, uh, I saw that Reinhard Bütikofer was uh, throwing in his hat. Uh, so Jacob, maybe uh, you read it out. Yeah. All right. So from Mr. Bütikofer, uh, when we recall the shared statement supported by the UK and 23 other countries criticizing the imposition of the national security law in Hong Kong um, at the UNHRC in Geneva a couple of weeks ago. Um, it is striking how much, uh, how much this was an OECD countries alliance. In dealing with China, the US and the EU often seem to be ignoring the roles to be played by countries of the global south. Isn't the real challenge way, way beyond rallying the West? And how are we going to deal with that? Uh, 
Yeah. Well, my answer would be uh, a united West. Uh, the impact of a united West to the global South would be uh, based on common values and shared values uh, would be much more influential, would be much more stronger, and it would be much uh, more uh, uh, much more difficult for China to overcome uh, such a position than a disunited West. Uh, that's my answer. Yeah, um, maybe let me respond to that as well. I think the Global South here is key <clears throat> because as long as the Global South is not involved at all, China can always say, well, these are just a few haters over there in the West. They're jealous of us, um, but they're really a minority and the majority of countries are on our side, even though that is not the case. So, but the, the, the United West is the bare minimum that has to happen. Um, but that also, what, what it does need to, I fully agree that we also need to reach out way more to democracies in the global south, to various countries <clears throat> in, in China's neighborhood, and to start working more proactively with them. Um, and there are a lot of shared interests. And I have to say, if, if the United West thing doesn't work out um, this year, next year, whenever, I do think it would be in Europe's interest as well to start reaching out more to what we always refer to as the like-minded countries um, as a shorthand and, and to start thinking about what, what else can be done there um, to mitigate <clears throat> the impact of that failing alliance, which I, again, I, I, I do have hopes that it's not gonna fail, but in, in any case, I, I agree, this has been overlooked or it, it hasn't been done sufficiently. And it is really key in countering this key narrative that's coming out of China that, you know, it's only the West that ever is upset with what we're doing. And they're really just those isolated few who, who don't like what we're doing. Um, so absolutely agree. We need to work on that more. Yeah, but uh, allow me uh, to pour some water into the glass. Um, it's, um, if you look to Iran, uh, it's the recent developments we see there is uh, Europe is not strong enough uh, to counter uh, Trump's policy towards Iran. So uh, Iran is in a, in a very threatening situation, um, isolated by the United States and uh, Europe not strong enough uh, uh, to move according to the uh, GCPOA uh, uh, together in the future, and then a Chinese alternative. Uh, so the weakness of the West, the disunity of the West, created an opportunity, uh, whether it will be uh, for the sake of uh, Chinese interests in the long term, we will see. But first of all, it created an opportunity. Uh, and this is... Uh, the outfall of uh, disunity of the West. Uh, let's face it. Is Biden going to change that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I no. I mean, <clears throat> I, I think it's going to make it a, a Biden presidency would make it a lot easier to get Europe back on board. I yeah. honestly don't think that the China strategy. I mean, there are maybe some people who advise Biden who would like to go back to the older approach, but there are also a lot of people around him that are actually fully, not fully on board with what Trump, Trump is doing, but that do see the rivalry and that do see China under the CCP as something that needs to, that needs a better strategy than just what has been happening over the past three decades. So I don't actually think that all of this is going to just, what the United States has been doing is going to change abruptly if Biden comes to power. Um, I do think there are enough people who would advise him to do things, push push back more, um, but it would make it easier to reach out to Europe. Um, and it would make my hopes, and again, this is like maybe misplaced hopes, but I, I, I do think it would be possible to pursue the strategy that the United States has been pursuing very erratically in a more systematic way and it'll make it easier to reach out to Europe. So I do have certain hopes that that could fix something. Not absolute, but that would be the better option. Jacob? Yeah, I'm gonna combine a couple of uh, quite kind of similar questions. 
Um, so we've 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 had in this conversation um, a fair amount of discussion about the idea that China needs to change um, and whether or not the West can can get it to change. Um, but we have a couple of questions, um, sort of asking, is this not sort of an arrogant um, sort of assumption that the Western model is the right one? Um, and would it not be smarter to look at ways to, to kind of coexist um, or to engage with China to try to develop more of a working relationship rather than to push for change? Well, I mean, from my point like of view, China is too big and uh, too powerful uh, to be pressured to, towards change. Uh, China will change if uh, the pressure of the contradictions of economic uh, or social contradictions will put pressure on the ruling party, uh, but not from the outside. Um, that's my answer. I think uh, in the world of the 21st century, we have to deal with China as it is. Be, let's be realistic, not a dream of China as it is. Uh, we have to deal with them. Uh, we have to deal with them in, um, climate change, whatever. And uh, it can't be isolated. And it, uh, regime change isn't a strategy uh, which can be used uh, towards China. I, I think it's a complete illusion. I mean, this was kind of the point I was trying to make earlier as well, is that the, the fallacy of our China policy, or maybe the, even the lack of our China strategy has been, that it's been caught up in this weird engagement rhetoric and that somehow it was never really challenged um, that, you know, through engagement, we're going to change China, which I think, again, not everybody believed in, but that was just put out there, which led to never having a real good solid China strategy for how to manage that relationship. And that was what I was saying earlier. Our, our goal should not be to get the CCP to change. That really is something that you can, you can create conditions for it, yes, and that's usually not through engagement, but through putting up more boundaries <clears throat> and to putting down your own red lines. But that's going to come from the inside eventually at some point, and I hope that when it happens, it won't be very ugly. Um, but that's not something imposed from the outside. And again, like I said, it's very difficult to get the CCP to do something that it doesn't want to do. And that's really where that thinking has to be abandoned. Look for the few areas where there really is common ground and not just common ground because the party says so and says, you know, we're a champion of multilateralism. So don't look at the words <clears throat> that the party puts out there, but it look at from its own fundamental interests, where does it have actual interests? And this is where there is an area to work together on topics like, I mean, climate change is the standard. Some other areas might be arms control where the, where the CCP might have an, an interest in working with the international community on that. Um, but to, to focus on that areas and to make sure that you don't compromise on too many other things and you don't hold yourself back. Like there's this idea, oh, if we now criticize China over Hong Kong, then maybe our thing that we were trying to work out won't work out. And that is the wrong kind of thinking. If the CCP has an interest in the cooperation, it's going to happen. If it has no interest in it, it doesn't matter whether you criticize it on other things or not. That thing is already on very, very shaky legs. So just really look for the stuff that the party really is interested in. On that, you can work together. On everything else, you need to make sure that you kind of stick to your guns and don't censor yourself, don't hold yourself back because you're worried it might endanger some, some cooperation with China. Doesn't the EU Commission have uh, nailed it, found the right uh, wording for it by saying last year under the uh, Juncker administration that China is a partner and China is a competitor and China is a rival so that we look at the whole thing and not just uh, at the, the rival part or the the opponent part. As, as Mr. Fisher said, uh, uh, it's very hard to push 20% uh, of uh, population globally and an economy which represents uh, to more than 20% of global GDP. Well, I, I agree fully what Marika said. Uh, uh, I think uh, 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 rational strategy uh, to China, towards China in the future needs uh, a, a strong commitment 
to your own interest and to your own values. Uh, the naivety of yesterday must be uh, put aside. Uh, that's uh, not a working strategy. Uh, China is a, a powerful uh, factor in global politics and global economy, but uh, we, uh, we don't have to make hotels. If we think something is wrong, we have to speak out, whatever the cost will be. Uh, that's our approach. And um, so we shouldn't be idealistic, we should be realistic. Uh, that's very important. On the other side, allow me to say, uh, not everybody who is in favor of uh, uh, dealing with China is uh, uh, a public agent of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this, uh, I would, uh, it, it raised some question marks when I read these uh, chapters. Uh, who is uh, an agent uh, of influence uh, for the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, it's not true. We have to find a way forward based on our own interests and based on our own values. No compromising as at the moment when our own values and our own interests are touched. Uh, but uh, be flexible in dealing with uh, the real China as it is uh, um, in all the other issues. This would be my advice. Jacob? Yeah, our next question um, is, it seems to mainly be directed at uh, Marika. Um, so the, uh, the questioner, or the person asking the question is, um, quote, reminded of Secretary of State Pompeo's comments about the CIA that, quote, we lied, we cheated, we stole. Um, so what makes the efforts taken by Chinese intelligence gathering and kind of influence operations um, and the different mechanisms that they use different from those used by Western countries. Um, and, and what does that mean for how uh, you think Western societies need to respond um, in a different way than what they might, you know, between the way they spy on each other? Um, yeah, I mean, intelligence and espionage is not my primary area of research. So that's not something where I would say that you should take my word as the last word for it. Um, I, I mean, we did look into it a little bit. Um, I do think there is, um, it, it, it is organized differently. I do think there is a greater, <clears throat> a greater opportunity, greater possibilities for the CCP to look at people who are in strategic positions, and that's obviously not everybody, but to put some pressure on these people. I mean, I've seen I've seen the the embassy over here trying to put pressure on some people to to do certain things for them, and in that case, actually, a lot of people that I know actually distanced themselves and said, "No, we're not actually going to do that." Um, but there there are more ways to pressure people into cooperating ad hoc. Um, so I think that is something that you wouldn't have with Western intelligence <clears throat> services. I also do think um, even you, you can you can make a case that there's also been economic espionage by Western intelligence services. Um, so I'm not saying that it's entirely unique to how the CCP's intelligence services operate, but it does have a much stronger, there's a much stronger focus on that and to make sure you have all that data also, not just it, not just political intelligence, but also to get all the data, all the data from companies. And I, I think if you are based in China, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, I don't know you, the people who are based there, will be able to speak more to that. But I think it's incredibly difficult to protect your data um, if you are interacting with the Chinese state. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think those are the main two differences that I would point out. Um, the, the response is incredibly difficult because, again, um, if you say anybody could be tapped, what people hear is, oh, everybody is tapped. So it, it's incredibly difficult to, to calibrate the right response um, and to make sure you get some people who are actually doing damage without overreaching. And right now, I'm, 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 I'm a little torn. I, I, do, I do see a lot of overreach. Um, and I am concerned about that, not so much in Europe, 
I think Europe hasn't fully woken up to that challenge, but in the United States, I do see some overreach. Um, but I also, I don't have a good solution um, other than to say, this is an issue, this is a problem that needs to be dealt with <clears throat> better yeah. than it is right now. Yeah. Uh, it has, uh, you know, your partner, uh, uh, co-author uh, Clive uh, is Australian. Uh, and he issued a book a couple of years ago, which was uh, a bestseller and actually changed Australians' uh, policy towards, uh, towards China. Uh, is Australia ahead of us in recognizing the challenges? Um, or uh, where, can, where can we Europeans uh, look at in order to have not a confrontational uh, style with China, but actually a more realistic style and how to deal with them? Um, I think Australia is way ahead of us, but that part of the reason why Australia is ahead of us is that it has been confronted with this earlier than Europe. Like the, for Europe, this only really became a thing starting 2014, 2015, when, you know, this kind of stuff that Australia has been experiencing for almost a decade longer became more, more of a reality, whereas Australia, as considered in the vicinity of China, was a different target all along. Um, I, I think it's actually looking to Australia <clears throat> is, is a good solution, not on everything, but on some things, including on how to manage your economic dependency on China. Um, and that because, I mean, if you look at Australia, the economic ex the exposure to the Chinese market is actually much larger than Germany's. And Germany is, I think, the most exposed in all of Europe. But still, even despite this exposure, Australia is beginning to push back more, to set down its boundaries. Um, so I think that's actually an encouraging, encouraging thing to look towards. And that kind of also confirms some of the things we've been discussing is like, again, don't be too intimidated. Don't be too intimidated by threats that China is going to cut you off from its market. If the Chinese side profits from your presence in China, it'll think twice before cutting something off. Um, it may threaten, it may do something temporarily, but this is another encouraging thing that we see from Australia um, that we're, if something is really solid and China profits off of that economic relationship, it's going to persist. If it's not, it doesn't matter again how much you hold yourself back, how many compromises you make, you're on kind of shaky legs to begin with because it could be, you could be replaced or cut off whenever <clears throat> whenever the next opportunity arises. And that, for, to, that to me is actually one of the points where I think we should be looking towards Australia, how to manage a relationship under circumstances where the dependence is even greater than ours, much greater. Okay, um, Jacob? Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm, once again, I'm gonna combine a couple questions here. Um, first to uh, Ms. Olberg. Um, the CCP has, you know, attempted to actively use pressure to drive censorship and self-censorship in foreign countries. Um, a good example being the NBA. Um, so to what extent, uh, you know, do you think different speakers and thinkers in Europe are, uh, and leaders as well, are self-censoring um, to avoid, uh, you know, certain sensitive issues? And then um, kind of moving off of that for, for Mr. Fisher, um, are, are German political leaders and uh, business and economic leaders sort of doing the same considering the, the level of integration um, and sort of vested interests that Germany has with China? Um, do you think it's possible for, for German leaders to, to really directly address these issues um, without potentially upsetting these vested interests? Um, I think, yeah, that, that is a problem. <laughs> um, and again, oftentimes you don't necessarily hear about it until you talk to people and until you find out what's going on in terms of internal communication. I think so far, again, pushback against individual companies has been incredibly successful, I think, in getting other companies to fall in line. Um, at least from, from where I'm standing, it looks that way. Um, so I, I think it's been reasonably successful. It doesn't always work at the political level, but the thing is, the idea, this, it has a collective effect. And the idea is if you have, if you put out this threat and you have 10 people and eight out of 10 people comply with it, 
from the CCP's point of view, you're already in a much better position because you only have two people to deal with rather than 10 people to deal with. So collectively, it has an impact. And that is true, I think, throughout all fields, including, you know, in the think tank world and the academic world. If eight out of 10 people change how they speak and talk about China, that changes the overall picture that you have. And, and that is perhaps good enough. There are always going to be exceptions of people who are going to say, I'm not going to allow this to let me shut up. I'm not going to let that happen. But they are, there are fewer of them. And that's how the strategy works. Um, and that's something that we really do need to change. And this is why, again, I always push, push for this idea that don't hold yourself back. Don't censor yourself on one issue just because you think you need to achieve something in another area where perhaps the party has no interest in achieving that to begin with. Just the stuff <clears throat> that they're interested in, they'll do. If they're not interested in it, they won't do it. Well, the question uh, to me, um, of course, uh, there is an ongoing debate, not only in Germany, in, in Europe, in the European Parliament, uh, for example. And uh, there is an extremely important change in the uh, attitude of the European Union and of the Commission and the Parliament uh, uh, and also uh, the member states uh, towards uh, China. I think uh, this shouldn't be underestimated. On the other side, you have uh, constant pressure from the business community uh, to be uh, certain questions. But I think uh, in the public opinion, uh, this will not work. Uh, and uh, from my view, um, China has made some important mistakes. Hong Kong, for example. Uh, this is a, a, a big blow against all the, the hidden hand strategy. Uh, because it's hard to defend. Uh, and uh, it's also seen as a uh, direct attack on basic values uh, of uh, uh, Europe. Uh, at the end, it was a, an agreement which was made between the United Kingdom and China. And uh, it's hard to understand why uh, uh, this is uh, now moving in a direction of a very severe repression. So from that point of view, yes, we have a debate, uh, but again, I think uh, uh, the political leaders uh, uh, are moving in the right direction. They have to balance the different interests, of course, uh, my advice would be not to follow the uh, American confrontational strategy as long as we don't have a debate with the United States and a common decision uh, whether we should go in that direction or not. Uh, be open for a more reunited West, yes. But uh, I think uh, Europe should to try to find a third way in dealing with this uh, factor China in the 21st century. Uh, and uh, that's more or less uh, where the majority in, uh, in Germany, the political leaders in Germany, are moving in that direction. Jacob? All right, our next question. Uh, Mr. Fisher described the successful Chinese system as a combination of an authoritarian Leninist political regime um, combined with a relatively free market. Uh, so to all three speakers, uh, to what extent do you believe such a system can be exported to other countries? Um, and would countries adopting such systems be more likely to emerge as strong, independent, sovereign entities, or as members of a union sharing the same sort of communist international values, uh, something sort of like a, a, an old common turn sort of system? Who goes first? <laughs> wants to start. <laughs> well, honestly, uh, being the third wheel here, um, I think that this model cannot really be exported. It is a, a model that uh, grew out of backwardness uh, in the sense that China had a long way to catch up and still does. Uh, China is a 25% GDP per capita 
and there still has a lot of economic growth potential, which of course then helps the party to rule and to uh, guide uh, the populace as it does right now. Uh, there are not many people, not many countries who have this kind of uh, uh, potential, this kind of uh, drive or fuel in the tank in order to get there. Uh, then, of course, you also have the confusion background uh, that <laughs> people are, uh, to a large extent, uh, very much believing in, uh, uh, in, in superiors, uh, in, in parties and, and all of the like. Uh, that's possibly different in other societies. Um, and uh, I guess uh, we have to remain to see if, if it's really export worthy, uh, given the fact that actually China has so many internal challenges. Uh, the, the, the very slow and uh, development of institutions, uh, the kind of stifling of uh, open speech, which then basically makes policy making very difficult because it's just the opinion of few people that actually gets translated into actions for 1.4 billion people. So I'm not sure actually um, uh, that it is a model that can be exported. And frankly, I'm not sure that there are many countries that actually want to import it. Um, let me maybe add on to that. So far, I've seen a lot of rhetoric about exporting that model, both in Western countries that are like, this is going to get exported, that's horrible. And on the Chinese side that likes to increasingly talk about the China model, the China case or Chinese wisdom, how it's referred to in official speech. Um, but that is more rhetoric so far. I'm, I don't think we're going to see a wholesale export of that model because I think the economic conditions and different countries vary too much. What I do see and what I think is going to happen and whether that is going to be with the help of the Chinese government or without it is some export and some learning on the authoritarian toolkit um, on how to suppress speech on how to be better at managing dissent in your own country um, on how to manage the internet how to how to <clears throat> so some of that authoritarian toolkit that is done is used very successfully in China. Um, by comparison, I tend to refer to most other authoritarian countries as amateur dictatorships. Like when I saw how Egypt was struggling with censorship back in 20, 2010, that would be unthinkable for China. Um, so I, I think some, a, a lot of that is going to spread. Um, also in terms of some of the stuff that's going to be spreading together with Chinese technology, the assumptions that are inbuilt into these technologies, they're also going to help export some of that surveillance model to other countries. And those are going to be mainly primarily authoritarian governments that want to improve um, their authoritarian toolkit. But that is not a wholesale export of the Chinese models. So on that end, I, I agree that is not going to happen. It's just going to happen selectively in some areas. I agree what uh, the two speakers before me uh, outlined. But uh, this has also uh, a downside, exporting authoritarian elements of the toolkit, because then uh, you are in the focus of a, a, a possible public reaction. Let's watch Iran. I mentioned it uh, twice before. Let's watch Iran. What will be the outfall? Uh, if the Iranian regime tries uh, to implement elements of the toolkit, uh, of the authoritarian Chinese toolkit. Let's see what uh, the consequences will be. This is, has also a downside. Uh, you are part of, then you are part of the repression. And if there is a, a public revolt or uh, an uprising, uh, you are also addressed. This is a, um, not only a, a positive element. May I just say that what is really worthy importing from China uh, is uh, the Chinese DNA of how to deal with life, the kind of entrepreneurship, the kind of uh, risk taking, the kind of engagement that uh, the Chinese citizens have. Uh, this is something where I think uh, in particular complacent countries can learn a lot, the eagerness to learn and so forth and so forth. Uh, so if we look beyond the system and the political party setting, I think there is a lot uh, of stuff that export uh, would be uh, would be positive from the Chinese point of view, um, uh, and and for all of us, uh, again the model no, but uh, the kind of uh, uh, historic development of the people, I think there there is definitely a lot we can learn from. Uh, Jacob, we get to the end. One more question. Yeah, we've got time for one more. 
All right, so let's consider for a while that um, the US will not be able to keep its uh, supreme position um, in the future and will kind of retrench. And whether that happens uh, because Trump gets reelected um, or that his uh, perspective and point of view sort of prevails in um, you know, the future of US politics. Is there a chance for Europe, um, a, a, is, is, it, is it possible for Europe to kind of go it alone um, or to create sort of a third strong pole um, in order to, to address sort of the, the challenges coming out of China? Well, uh, I think uh, the bad option, Trump will be reelected and we will end up in chaos with a lot of opportunities for China. It will be, uh, China will benefit from such a re-election of Trump. And uh, the second uh, uh, question mark uh, remains with uh, the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, what will be the uh, outfall for uh, the global system? We don't know at the moment. But I think Europe is uh, quite in a good position uh, in addressing these crises. Uh, Europe has to go through uh, uh, a lot of changes. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic that they can make it, but uh, to go alone, it will be extremely hard and tough. If the decision uh, will be made by the American uh, voters uh, to re-elect Trump, uh, then uh, Europe will be forced in such a position. If not, if Biden will... Uh, be re-elected. We, we are not going back to the old times, uh, but uh, before Trump, but uh, I think it will be easier uh, to reach common positions and there will be no need to go alone. That's the difference. I mean, par part of the reason why I'm running around currently and screaming my head off about the topic that I'm talking about is that I think, yeah, there is a chance that Trump could get re-elected and under those circumstances, Europe will absolutely have to get its act together on China. We've been moving in the right direction over the past four years, but we're far from there. And there is still a lot of uncertainty about how to actually deal with China. Again, if the United States continues to descend into chaos, we're going to have to think about, you know, what can we, what, where can we work together with the United States, but also look beyond that, who else can we work with? First of all, we need to get our China policy internally in order and then look for other countries around the world that we can form alliances with to push back more effectively because it, the United States can't go it alone. Europe itself by itself also cannot go it alone. It would then have to build alliances with other countries. Is that realistic? I don't know. But I, I do think it is important for Europeans to understand that this might be necessary and to start thinking about how to do that more effectively. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, we have reached the end of our discussion. Unfortunately, I have seven topics here that has not been covered, uh, particularly the UK point of no return, yes or no, given the fact that they have kicked out Huawei um, and uh, who are the friends and who are the naive uh, uh, followers, uh, fellow, followers of China. Uh, lots of stuff, Marek. I hope that for all of you uh, in the audience, it was thought provoking, agree or not agree with uh, what you just heard. And uh, I would like to really thank uh, Joschka Fischer uh, for being the, the moderator uh, and uh, bringing his time and his wisdom to the table. Uh, it's always wonderful to hear again from you. And then, of course, Marika, uh, good luck and uh, with the launch of your book around the world, um, uh, it is definitely going to be talked about. Um, and let me just say, we have one more book up our sleeve in about two weeks from now. Uh, it is written by a, a Chinese author uh, based in Michigan, a professor, uh, Ang Yuan Yuan, and she wrote a book on China's Gilded Age, The Paradox of Economic Boom and Vast Corruption. Um, and uh, you might have seen the review in The Economist a while ago, actually last month, uh, where David Rennie has said that uh, corruption is certainly bad, but it once emboldened Chinese power holders to take useful risks. So we're going to look at corruption from two ends. And in order to hold uh, David accountable uh, for what he just wrote in June in The Economist, uh, we will have to have him as a moderator 
uh, in about two weeks from now. So tune in. Thank you very much for joining. And again, uh, vielen Dank, Herr Fischer, and vielen Dank, Marike, uh, für die Teilnahme. And all the best to you to in Berlin. Bye-bye.